Hello everyone, uh, I downloaded Presentation Tube to try to see how that works. So hopefully this goes well. Um, I did mine on Milkweed by Jerry Spinelli. And this is another book on the Holocaust. I think it's a very prevalent topic in middle school, so I just decided to pick this one. Plus I can't find an English book in Greece. So. Okay, so some of the major characters, I just named a few, some of the bigger ones that impacted the main character, who is Misha Pilsudski, a very difficult name. Um, this is actually not his name, this is the name given to him in the novel, and if you read it, you'll see why. He's an orphan gypsy boy living in Warsaw, Poland. Yuri is a Jewish boy that takes care of Misha throughout the novel. He's like, takes him in and teaches him how to live on the streets. Uh, he's the one who gives Misha his name. Enos, Kuba, Ferdy, John, and Big Henrik are also boys that live in the streets with Yuri. Um, Janina Milgram is a young Jewish girl that Misha befriends and protects. Her father, mainly her father, her family, generally though, takes Misha in during their time in the ghetto. Um, Mr. Milgram is Janina's father, and Dr. Korkzak is an orphan house owner. So the summary of the novel is that it's basically about an orphan gypsy boy named Misha living in Warsaw during the beginning of the Holocaust. He meets a group of boys that take him and teach him how to live on the streets. Later, he meets a young Jewish girl named Janina, whose family takes him in as their son. During his time in the ghettos and sporting his new Jewish armband, Misha and Janina wander the city at night to find food and materials to survive. Misha and everyone around him must dodge jackboots and flops, which if you read the novel you'll figure out who they are, and try to remain as invisible as possible. However, when one of Misha's friends, Uri, Yuri, tells him that trains are coming to deport the Jews out of the ghetto, Misha must help Janina and himself get out. I really don't want to spoil the ending because I didn't expect it, so if you want to read it, please do. Uh, I just decided to get some symbols up in there that I saw, some quick ones that are in the novel. The milkweed is, for most of the novel, you don't understand why milkweed is the title. Um, however, milkweed does symbolize angels and souls. Angels are very prevalent in this novel. He questions, uh, M Misha questions their ex existence a lot. So angels are a symbol of hope and protection. Shoes, which also come up a lot, are a symbol of survival. If you have shoes, you're kind of okay. Um, a brick wall that goes up between two parts of the city is the barrier between life and death or earth and heaven. Oranges, which are mentioned quite a few times, are a symbol of happiness and nostalgia. Buttercreams with hazelnut hearts, which are Misha's favorite, are a symbol of friendship because he gets Anyone who is his friend gives him a buttercream with hazelnut hearts at any point. Uh, Yuri is Misha's angel, and Misha is Janina's angel. Alright, so some themes that I saw in there. Uh, friendship endures and gives us strength. So Misha learns to survive the streets of Warsaw because of the friendship he builds with Yuri and the other boys. Misha and Janina work together to keep Janina's family alive in the ghetto and to keep each other strong. Misha survives the Holocaust because of the friends he made, the sacrifices they make for each other, and the determination they give him to keep pushing for himself and others day after day. Another one is goodness can be found in the smallest packages. Misha is a small gypsy boy, like very small, that selflessly helps his friends, Janina and her family, and the orphan children throughout the story. So selflessly, absolutely selflessly, helping everybody else around him. Believing in something bigger and, and believing in happiness gives us strength. So Misha believes that there are angels around him and within everybody that watch over them and help protect them. This helps him remain hopeful and strong while in the ghetto. Throughout the novel, Misha never loses hope and always remains happy. When Misha helps Janina find her happiness again after she loses it for a little while, she regains the strength she needs to survive the ghetto. These are just a few. There are many more, but just a few. So some big questions I was thinking about asking a group of middle schoolers, maybe, are before the novel, what makes a good friend? Because friendship is a big issue in this novel. Um, are people always treated fairly? This novel is about the Holocaust, obviously. They're going to have to have a discussion on the Holocaust. What is discrimination? Is it so prevalent today? 
stuff like that. What gives people strength? Misha is the strongest character in this novel, yet he has the least. He doesn't even have a family. What keeps him strong? Um, why is this novel titled Milkweed? Maybe have the kids make some predictions because, as I said, reading through half the novel, you don't know why it's called Milkweed. Um, during the novel, I would ask, would Misha be safer if he understood what was happening to the Jews? Misha really doesn't understand. He's very, um, naive about the whole situation in Warsaw during this time. Is Yuri a good friend to Misha? At some points, he seems a little bit harsh. Um... And then, is Misha a good friend to Janina? Some of the stuff they do together wouldn't really seem friend-like. Um, why does Misha want to help everybody? He could keep all the food that he steals for himself, but he doesn't. He gives it away. Why? Why does he do that? And then, after the novel, did Misha survive the Holocaust by himself? Was it Misha's own personal strength, or did anybody help him? Will Misha ever tell his daughter why he named his granddaughter Janina? That's at the end of the novel, so I might have given a little bit away there. But um, I think that's a good question to ask the students, because we don't find out at the end of the novel, but maybe they can make some predictions. And then, will or can anything like the Holocaust happen again? It did happen. It was a massive genocide. So, can it happen again? How did we let that happen? And then fourth one, what is the significance of the title Milkweed in this novel? Milkweed is a symbol, a big symbol in this novel, and hopefully the students will grasp onto why it's called milk. The novel is called Milkweed. They should catch on. All right, so a little bit of icotarpal, I yeah, analysis of the plot and the setting of the novel. The setting is Warsaw, Poland. It's in a ghetto during the World War II. Um, the plot is, there's four of them, person versus person, it's Misha, Uri, Janina, all of the Jews in the novel, all of the Jews in society are being beaten and discriminated against by the Germans. Person versus society, Misha, Uri, Janina, and all of the Jews in society are again being discriminated against by the Germans. They don't have a place in society, it's them against society. Person versus nature, Misha, Yuri, Janina, and all the Jews, again, must stay warm and find food to stay alive while being in the ghettos. They're not given anything. Uh, Misha has to steal everything that he gets, all the food that he gives away, he steals. Person versus self, Misha is on a journey to find his identity throughout the entire novel. He does not have a family. He does not remember anything about his past. He knows he's a gypsy, but that's it. Um, Yuri makes a story for him, but... He knows it's not his real story, so he's on that journey. Uh, person versus technology. I mean, there's guns and stuff, but it just really didn't seem technological, like, even important in the novel. All right, so some character analysis. The hero of the story is obviously Misha. He's a protagonist and main character, and he grows throughout the story. At first, he's very naive, very small, doesn't know anything about himself, and as the story progresses, he still remains small and still remains naive, but he gains friends, he learns information, and he figures out who he wants to be. Men the mentor is Yuri, the boy that teaches Misha how to survive on the streets. He's the first one to take him in and give him a place to sleep, wash him up. He even saves him multiple times throughout the story, especially at the end. Um, the biggest shape shifter that I saw for Misha was Janina, uh, the girl who befriends and takes Misha to her family. At first, she's just a girl who plays with Misha and looks up to him. She's like two years younger than him or so, so... Um, and then she turns into a girl who wants to be independent and doesn't want to follow Misha around. She wants to do her own thing, but Misha stays there and watches over her. Uh, the shadow is... This one, I'm always struggling with the shadow, but I found it was the Jews dying in the street. Um, Misha does not want to die. He doesn't want anyone he knows to die. So he steals and he cares for them very selflessly. So he just does not want to become one of those dead bodies lying in the street. The evil I saw, I mean, obviously, is the Germans, Jackboots, and Flaps. Uh, the Jackboots are killing the Jews. They're basically just the soldiers, the Nazi soldiers, um, killing the Jews and keeping them in the ghetto. And then some Jews become Flaps, and they harm other Jews in the ghetto.
So that becomes an issue. Um, the threshold guardians are Dr. Korczak and Mr. Milgram. Dr. Korczak, as I said, is the owner of the orphanage. He's in charge. And he helps clean up Misha after Misha brings the orphans food. Um, Mr. Milgram takes Misha in as his son. That's Janina's father. And he gives him a place to sleep and stay. And he teaches him about Hanukkah. He makes Misha an honorary Jew. And um, basically helps him find his identity. Tricksters, Enos, Kuba, John, Big Henrik, and Ferdy are the boys that lived with Yuri, the boys that took in Misha. And they make a joke out of everything. They make have some serious conversations, especially about angels. But um, they definitely turn them into laughing matters or arguments that are not too serious. So they were they were the comic relief, I guess, in a hard topic. So this is the first passage I chose for the closed reading. It looks like a lot, but it really isn't. It's just a lot of short dialogue. So I'll go ahead and read it. In the stable that night, in the straw-smelling darkness, I said to Yuri, Is Enos right? There are no angels? There was no answer. Are you sleeping? I'm trying to, came his voice. Your silly questions. How do I know? Enos is whatever you want him to be. You want him to be right? No, I said. I want him to be wrong. Fine, he's wrong. I want to believe in angels, I think. Fine, believe. But Eno said angels are for jackboots. You're a jackass, that's what you are. And a silly one. You don't say I'm stupid anymore. Now I'm silly. Take your pick. But I'm not a jackboot. How can I believe in angels? When you're nothing, you're free to believe anything. Go to sleep, Misha. I tried to go to sleep, but a question kept nagging me. Yuri, he snarled, what? Do you believe in angels? I believe in bread. He said, now shut up or I'll come over there. I shut up. So this is when uh, angels are first introduced into the novel. Misha sees an angel in a graveyard, a big statue. And he says, wow, that's beautiful. And then the boys, the tricksters, make angels a comic relief. They have a discussion. Enos gets very mad because he says, no, angels wouldn't, aren't existing because look at us. Look, we don't have food. We don't have shoes. We have nothing. They should be protecting us and look at us. So angels become very prevalent throughout the novel and um, very prevalent to the title of being milkweed. Uh, so. so for signposts, this passage has again and again, because angels will become a reoccurring topic in the novel. And I would want students to recognize that angels will become important for Misha. He's having the struggle right now, whether or not to believe. Enos doesn't believe because he says that jackboots believe. And they're clearly not jackboots, but Misha wants to believe. He wants to believe that there's something watching over them. And then another sign posts is tough questions. Whether or not angels exist is a tough question for everybody, um, especially for these boys living in the ghetto. Misha has to decide whether he wants to believe in angels, despite everything that's happening around him. And then I would want students to recognize the difficulty of this question and maybe even ask it themselves. I don't want to get very re religious or religious at all, really, in the classroom, but maybe that's something they want to ask themselves privately. Maybe it's something they've been thinking about. Um, so this is my second passage for the close reading, and I'll read this one too. Happy. I had not heard that word since Mr. Milgram spoke it at the last Hanukkah. I asked him the question that had been on my mind since then. Tata, what is happy? He looked at me and then the ceiling and back at me. Did you ever taste an orange? He said. No, I said, but I heard of them. Are they real? Never mind. He stared at me some more. Did you ever... He stopped and shook his head. After more staring, he said, Were you ever cold and then you were warm? I thought of sleeping with the boys under the braided rug, cold, then warm. Yes, I blurted. Was that happy? He smiled. That was happy. I felt again the cuddled tenth of warmth. Sometimes I, could, I would stick my nose out to better feel the warmth on the rest of me. Under the rug. No, he said. He tapped my chest. Happy is in here. He tapped on his own chest. Here. I looked down past my chin. Inside? Inside. It was getting crowded in there. First angel, now happy. It seemed there was more to me than cabbage and turnips. I looked at Janina sitting potato-faced on the floor. She hadn't smiled since the burning cow. Janina does not have happy. He squeezed my shoulder. He smiled sadly. No. So this passage is introducing happiness 
to Misha. He's heard of it, but he doesn't know what happiness is. To me, this passage is very powerful because it shows that Misha is very strong because he has happiness no matter what's happening. Despite everything that's happening around him, he always remains positive. And this could be because he's so naive to everything happening around him. But it does seem to be giving him strength. Um, Misha is also determined to see the positive in everything, whether or not he knows that he's doing that. And he wants to make everybody else happy. Because that's what's keeping them alive. He wants to believe in angels and he wants to remain happy. So the signposts in this passage are words of the wiser. So Misha is learning from Mr. Milgram what happiness is. And he's recognizing that from this like lesson that other people around him don't have happiness. And that Janina is losing hers. And that's what's making her lose her strength. So I would want my students to think about what happiness is for them. And then think about what it would be like to not have that happiness. What it would be like to lose that one thing. Mr. Milgram's um, example was the orange. And that's an example for a lot of people. Most people in this story don't know what an orange tastes like. But they know that it's something delicious. It's um, happiness. And so that's Mr. Milgram's happiness. And he's without it right now. Um, an aha moment is also in this passage, and that's Misha learning happiness, what it is, and why it's giving him strength. He also realizes that Janina is losing her, and is losing her strength. So I would want my students to think of ways that they could help someone else find happiness. This could even be turned into a school project for bullying. Maybe if they see a sad student, how can you make that student smile that day? It could become some sort of um, project or some sort of, like... What do you call it? Not dare, but like you send your students out there to try to make someone else happy. Give them some strength. So some ap educational applications for this novel. The Scholastic.com gives this a grade level equivalent of fifth grade. And the Lexile measure is 510. But due to the language, you saw in my first passage that they mentioned the word jackass. And they mentioned some other nasty names and stuff. So just because of the language and because of the topic, I would say seventh grade, um, personally. And that's also when they learn about the Holocaust, seventh, eighth grade. So key concepts to teach with this novel would be Nazi Germany during World War II, um, the Holocaust, mass genocide, and even discrimination. Uh, concerns while teaching would be inappropriate language. As I said, that's why I would make it a higher grade level and just make sure that your students treat this with maturity. And then it's a difficult topic for students of Jewish religion, even gypsy descent or even German descent. Um, they don't want to, the Jews don't want to relive that because they're ancestors and the gypsies and the Germans don't want to be blamed for that. Um, so just this novel needs to be treated with maturity. And then some more applications, some activities to do. I'm a big journaler. I think students would benefit from journals all the time. So I think they should keep journals as if they were in the Holocaust or as if they were in the ghettos. Maybe think about what they would want to do, what they would see around them, how they would want to survive, stuff like that. I think participating in a fishbowl discussion and answer the before, during, and after questions from the previous slide would benefit. It would get them thinking, get their minds rolling. And fishbowls make sure that every single person participates. This could even be true for liter literature circles. Um, I also love graffiti charts and leaving them up in the room throughout the whole unit. So before beginning the novel, have the students go around and name things that they already know about Nazi Germany, the Holocaust, anything like that, World War II even. And then keep adding to it as they read through the novel and then after the novel, what more can they add? And then look over it and see what they gained through this novel. And then also taking a field trip to the Holocaust Museum or listening to a Holocaust survivor give a speech. I mean, there's plenty of those on YouTube or if one is giving one in person, that's even better. Um, so trying to align this novel with other subject, we've said that this is extremely hard to do, but I mean, social studies and history, if they're learning about the Holocaust, Nazi Germany and World War II, stick this book in there. It fits perfectly and they can just combine both math. I mean, just a problem that involves calculating the distance from Warsaw to the concentration camp that the train is going to take them to, or a problem that involves calculating the amount of time the train would have taken 
to do this trip. Um, I couldn't really find one for science, um, but yeah. So those are my sources, Google Images for the pictures, Scholastic for the grade level, and then the novel. This novel was a really good read, and I really think that it would be good for middle schoolers. It is on an elementary school level for writing. It's very easy to read, but again, the language and the topic is just more advanced than a fifth grade class, I think. Um, there's a lot you can do with it, a lot, a lot of projects, a lot of activities. I just definitely recommend it. It was a really good read. It wasn't my favorite Holocaust novel, but it is a very good read. And Jerry Spinelli is an excellent writer. And I'm sure students will have read his work, so it will be good. All right, thanks, guys.